Lord, give each one of them that's praying for them to be saved. We ask that they be this offering. Thank you, Lord, your good intentions. We thank you, Pastor. Number 200. 200.
you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we are going to be in the book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin reading uh, in verse uh, number 1. So Acts 2, beginning reading in verse number 1. Uh, as we come to this particular chapter in the book of Acts, we come to one of the greatest events uh, contained within the book of Acts. It's uh, definitely the most, one of the most important ones found in the book of Acts. What we find recorded in these first several verses of this chapter is really what makes the rest of the book of Acts possible. Uh, without the events of Acts chapter 2, verse several verses, uh, the other rest of the book of Acts could happen. Uh, because this is the fulfillment of the promises that Christ gave, and this is the empowering and this is what makes it possible now for the church to go out and to do the commission, and to go out and to do the work that Christ has put before them and charged them to do. Uh, it says in verse 1, it says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilee? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, where we were born? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt. In the parts of Libya, about the Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Greeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth these? And others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, you men of Judah, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last day, he said, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants, on my handmaids, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. We'll pause our reading right there for the moment. Uh, these are the first of several verses that we've read. Uh, there are uh, several things that stand out within these verses. I think one of the more interesting things to notice here is that according to Peter, uh, when he begins to preach there in the uh, verse 15, he says it's but the third hour of the day. You know, one might be uh, tempted to read the verses in the first part of this chapter and think that we're covering a, a large uh, time span here. You know, this is a spread abroad throughout the whole city, but it's only the third hour of the day by the time Peter starts to talk, so you're talking 9 o'clock. And so you know, this isn't uh, something that happened, uh, and then it just... Uh, took a long time for everyone to hear and to know of it, uh, you're only talking the third hour of the day. There is a lot of things that occurred in this one day on the day of Pentecost. It is a, uh, what we might think of as a very uh, busy day in the lives of the apostles in the day of the year of the church, especially by the time you get done uh, through the sermon and you find out in the end that there are uh, several thousand souls that added to the church that day. And so as uh, the beginning of a very active and a very busy day uh, for the first church that was there at Jerusalem. Uh, and it all begins on that uh, wonderful day uh, of 
Pentecost. And as you uh, begin in those verses, verse 1 of chapter 2, we find very simply uh, that it was the day of Pentecost had fully come upon them. They were all there with one accord in one place. I've already mentioned this a few times, but I'll mention it just again in passing. Notice the reference to the fact that they were all with one accord. It's prevalent throughout all the book of Acts, but especially in the first part of the book of Acts, special emphasis is given to the fact that when you see the church, they're unified. And they are in one accord. They are in harmony with themselves and with God. It is amazing what the church can accomplish when the church is actually working together and not working against itself. The unity of the church in the first part of the book of Acts and throughout the book of Acts is a large part of the reason why they were able to accomplish and to do so many things. And as you begin to look at this chapter and we begin to see this unfold, the very first thing I want us to really pay attention to this morning is the promise of His coming. Uh, the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as you look uh, throughout the book of Acts, as you back up into chapter 1, uh, Christ told his disciples on a couple of occasions uh, that they were to wait uh, and that they were to tarry in Jerusalem until this Holy Spirit descended upon them. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 1, he said, John truly baptized with water, but you were baptized with the Holy Spirit in not many days. Uh, the pro- coming of the Holy Spirit upon the New Testament church is something that has been prophesied for a great while. Matter of fact, you can back up all the way to the, to the days of John the Baptist. Uh, in Mark 1, you'll find that John the Baptist said, and, uh, I baptize you with water, uh, but there's one coming after me whose shoes are, uh, I'm not worthy to, to undo, and he will baptize you what? with the Holy Spirit. There's been this uh, looking ahead, this uh, promise to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Of course, if you look at the promise of the coming Holy Spirit, uh, the detail of the counting of that, beyond the simple promise of the Holy Spirit, yes, that's a promise of His coming, but that's a very uh, simple statement. There's not a lot of details about what that means or what's going to be involved in that account. But in the latter part of the Gospel of John, uh, beginning in John chapter 14, uh, Christ gives us several details about the coming of the Holy Spirit and why it was going to be so very important. Uh, in John 14, uh, verse 26, he says, The Comforter, uh, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, uh, whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, matter of fact, you go on to state, actually, you can go on to number one. Back up a few more verses, he talked about how it was expedient that he would go away, but that when he left, the Father was going to send another comforter uh, in his place. Christ promised in essentially this. He still his disciples, I'm about to be crucified. You should have already known that. He's playing to the deacon, but he's going to be crucified. And after his death, He'd be buried, then he'd be raised again, he would be departed from them. We saw that. The ascension of Christ in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. Christ is going to leave behind the church. The church was going to have to enter into a time frame where for the first time in its existence, its founder, that Jesus wasn't going to be there. Christ established the church to return the ministry. And for the first three and a half to four years of, his, of its existence, Christ was there. Uh, Christ was with his church, uh, teaching them, uh, educating them, trying to show to them what they needed to do, uh, how they were going to serve him. Uh, what was the church going to do without Christ, uh, at least physically being with them? Uh, how was that going to happen? Well, Christ explained to them and was teaching to them that even though he physically wasn't going to be there, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and would empower them and he would be with them. The comforter was just like unto Christ himself. They were going to say one. That same divine presence, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and he would be with them. And he would teach them all things. And Christ said, I will not physically be with you anymore, but the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you as a church and is going to teach you the things that you need to know. Uh, you'd go on to state 
uh, that that would be an evidence of the fact that he'd gone to the Father. He said, once the Holy Spirit has descended upon you, then you know that I've gone to the Father. And I think that's how he had explained. So Christ is promising that there was going to be one who would come alongside the church, who would aid them, and who would teach them all things that they required. <clears throat> and this was going to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, but perhaps the most detailed accounting of that is actually found on 14, but in 16. When Christ was speaking to the church, he told them, uh, beginning in 16, verse 4 of John, he said, But these things I have I told you, that when the time has come, that you may remember that I told you of it. These things I said unto you in the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask, Whither goest thou? Because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled you. Uh, behold, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For I go, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. For if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he has come, he will approve the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, that you cannot bear them now. I'll be when he, the spirit of truth, is come, and he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. But whatsoever he will hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive a mine, and will show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he will take a mine and will show it unto you. And so Christ is promising here a comforter, an aid, a helper. He's doing what comforter means there is someone to come alongside and to aid. The Holy Spirit coming upon the church is going to be a great aid in really two major areas. The way it aids the church itself is going to teach them, is going to help them to understand and to realize truth. But also it's going to be an aid to the church because of its work in the world. Now, he is going to convince the world. He is going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Uh, we know today that lost sinners have no desire, you and I, but before we knew Christ, we had no desire, no God. Uh, there's none that seek it after God, no, not one. Uh, nobody in and of themselves just desires to know God or seek Him. Uh, this is why God seeks out the law. Uh, Christ said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, God had called out to Adam. Adam and Eve and their sin hid from God. God had to call out. Uh, Adam, where art thou? And he was calling uh, the sinners unto him. And the New Testament presents the very same truth. Uh, no man would come unto the Father unless it was given unto him of the Spirit. Uh, no lost sinner comes to God unless God convicts them and draws them unto him. Uh, this is why it's a uh, token of grace. It's a wonderful truth to know today that God convicts the world of sin and draws all men unto himself. What a blessed truth. But how impossible of a work would we have today in New Testament churches if Christ had not sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit wasn't today convicting the lost? Uh, how hard and difficult would it be, how impossible task would it be to be sharing the gospel of salvation through Christ with the world if the Holy Spirit wasn't there convicting the world of sin? The Holy Spirit is what convicts us and uh, causes us to realize of our sin and of our need to repent of that sin and believe and to trust in Christ. Christ was promising the coming of the Holy Spirit of one who would aid and who would help the New Testament church. This is why Christ told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He told them to go out into the world and preach and proclaim the gospel. He said, but before you do that, wait in Jerusalem. Uh, wait there until the promise of the Holy Spirit is given, is fulfilled, and then once he comes, then you would go out and you proclaim truth. There was an order there. Yes, we're told to go, but the early church had to wait. Not for what we lost, just about a week, really. Uh, but they had to wait for this. They could not begin the work Christ gave them until the Spirit had come upon them. Yes, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon the New Testament church and empower them and enable them to now go out to this work. This is why the promise was so important. Now, I believe it is important to take a moment and to realize and understand that the Holy Spirit is coming upon the New Testament church 
uh, was simply that. This was an empowering of the New Testament church. This was not the first time that the Holy Spirit came to earth. The Holy Spirit has been active on the world since the beginning of creation. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first two verses of the Bible of Genesis tell us what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what was the next part of that? And the Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the waters. Uh, and God said that there was a lot. But even from the very beginning of the Bible, we're presented with this, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And that He is active. He's working in creation. And there are uh, many uh, verses that attest to that throughout the Old Testament. But uh, one of the uh, perhaps clearest that reveals to us He was working in Old Testament times, and, uh, that they were aware of that, uh, was uh, the words of David uh, in uh, the Psalms, in Psalm uh, 139. Uh, when David uh, is speaking, he says, uh, that there was no place, uh, no where he could go, that, he, that the Spirit of God was not there, and they could not find him. Uh, David understood and he knew that God's spirit could live with And uh, where he sought to hide, uh, he could not hide from the Lord, for God was everywhere. Uh, his spirit was there. The Old Testament saints understood and they knew that the spirit of God was active. And so if you think of what happened on the day of Pentecost, this isn't uh, the first time the Holy Spirit steps into action. This is not uh, some kind of uh, of new uh, person. This is a part of Trinity. This is God who always has been and always will be. Uh, he's been working with people. He's beginning a new ministry, a new work. As the Holy Spirit now uh, empowers the church, the church will be able to go out and do work. Uh, this is a, a new ministry, yes, uh, but the Holy Spirit is always been active. He will always be active, even after the church is taken out uh, from this world. The Holy Spirit will still be active and engaged in work. Uh, simply a new and different ministry in the Bible before the gospel the church didn't exist before Christ and so now the church is being empowered by the Holy Spirit and this was the great promise that he was going to come and that he would empower and enable the church you and I today do not need to forget or become unaware of the fact that the Holy Spirit is here and that he is able to help and he does help us uh, you and I today, though we may not have uh, the same uh, visual, I might use that terminology, the visual uh, awareness that they we find here in the book of Acts that we see as he descended upon them, the same power that enabled the church, the same power that works in and through us today. Uh, when the Holy Spirit uh, baptized the church there on the day of Pentecost and descended upon them, empowered them to that task. Any time that we as God's children join with the New Testament church, we uh, take part in uh, their authority and go out and do the work, how is that? Uh, you and I are not powerless in the, the work of Christ today. And no, we don't have the same uh, visions and signs that they had then, but it's the same power. And it's just as effective and just as powerful in working today. Which brings us to the next thing we need to notice is not only the promise of his coming, we also need to understand the signs of his coming. The signs, the visual manifestation. You know, when you uh, look throughout the Old Testament, uh, really you can look some New Testament times, and you think about the great appearances of God, those times that uh, prophets of old uh, saw the, the glory of God. So you know, we think of, of Isaiah when he was staying there in the temple and uh, he saw the, the glory of God before him and he, he fell down and he cried that he was uh, uh, he had unclean lips and he stood in the holiness of God. And so many of the times as you look throughout scripture and men uh, came face to face with the glory of God and they uh, saw and they realized how unclean and unworthy they were. Well, these first several verses uh, are really, in many ways, very similar to that. Uh, this is God, the Holy Spirit in this instance, uh, revealing himself in such a way that as he comes upon the church, men see and men know. And this particular instance is accompanied by noise. Matter of fact, it says it's a, a sound with a great, uh, mighty wind. Now, it's not actually the wind, it's just, it's like 
that. This was the noise like you hear from a great uh, rushing wind, the wind from a storm. It's this great echoing sound, and it <clears throat> reverberates and fills the entire house uh, where they are stationed at this time. This mighty wind comes upon them. Uh, this mighty, the sound of the mighty wind comes upon them. It's loud. It's echoing. Uh, they hear it. And as they hear this sound, it says that cloven tongues, uh, like unto fire, in verse 3, appear uh, over them. And so here this is the Holy Spirit. He's descending. Uh, you hear the sound of a mighty wind. You have this uh, this this fire, this a tongue that appears and it, it divides itself and it, it comes upon all the individuals that are assembled there in that room, however many that may have been. We know that in the latter part of chapter 1 there's 120 brethren that are assembled there. So how many ever people are in this room, this New Testament church assembled there? They all receive this Holy Spirit in a visible fashion and as they are uh, Standing there. Just pause for a moment before we even get into the rest of this chapter and just think for a moment what this had to have been like on the case of the apostles of the church that was there. They've been sitting here for a week, okay, give or take a day. Uh, they've been sitting there. We know from chapter 1 they've been preaching. Uh, and then a bit of me in chapter 1 up here, I was explaining the scriptures and how the, the office of Judas vacated needed to be filled. And so they've not been idle, so to speak, the last seven days. They've been working. Obviously, they can't leave Jerusalem yet, but they've been doing things. And then here it is, bright and early, as we consider the terminology. And here they are at this house. They're assembled together. And then all of a sudden, here comes this great sound. And then the Spirit descends with this uh, fire and the tongues that now descend upon them. You just imagine and pause and put yourself in that position and think about what you must have been going through your mind and the joy, the excitement, the uncertainty, all of these things as these things occur. And then we're told uh, that these tongues as they rested upon individuals that they began to speak in tongues. It says in verse 4, it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues and languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so this, this is the, uh, uh, the the sign, the evidence that the Holy Spirit descended, yes, but now he is with the church. That's kind of the, the flow of the pattern. You see he's there because you heard, you saw the sin, and then now you know he's with these individuals because they are speaking in these unknown languages. Now, as they are speaking, uh, again, notice that it is only as the Spirit gave them utterance. There is never any indication that any of this is some kind of chaotic, uh, just you know, random occurrence of things. Uh, even here in chapter 2 of Acts, there is a uh, an appearance of order. Now, we don't know everything that they said or done. We have no idea how many spoken tongues of a particular uh, occurrence, but the idea is still presented that it was an orderly event. Uh, the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, and so they spoke. Uh, we know from the book of Corinthians that uh, when people spoke in tongues, you're not supposed to be uh, you know, in, in order, not a whole bunch of people speaking at one time because that would have just been chaotic. But And so we, we don't know how all this occurred, but these men are speaking in tongues, and they are uh, speaking in languages they have never heard. The amazing thing is, is as they are speaking in tongues, everybody understands. <laughs> That's the uh, what you find out going on down. As it's known as abroad, we come to find out that all of these individuals who are assembled in Jerusalem, now this Passover, Pentecost, was uh, one of the feasts that every Jew had to travel for. And so when you're looking at Jerusalem at this time, it's not just the population of Jerusalem. Okay, this is people from literally every quarter of Rome. And so uh, you've got all these different individuals, Parthians, Medes, you see the list again in verse 9, Mesopotamia and Cappadocia, uh, and, and yet as all these people are assembled together, uh, Peter, the apostles, as they are speaking in tongues, what's happening is the message they're saying, and yet every single individual who's there, uh, they are hearing him speak in their own uh, native tongue and dialect. This is a, a 
remarkable occurrence. This is a remarkable demonstration of the power of God. Uh, to speak in one message, and yet everybody hears you and understands you in their own distinct language. You might consider this in some ways a reversing of the Tower of Babel. That's the easiest way I can understand it. Man used to have all one language, and now at uh, this gift of tongues, they're all speaking in other languages. Everyone hears and understands what is being said and what is being done. That is the other aspect of this that needs to always be remembered is that as they spoke in tongues, people understood them and knew what they said. Uh, you can find that in our verses because it says in verse 11, it says, We do hear them speak in our own uh, languages the wonderful works of God. And so everybody hears and understands. Speaking in tongues was never something that people didn't understand. And whenever people spoke in tongues, it was understandable. It was readily understandable. As they witnessed the word of God, been heard and been understood. And now as you look at the signs of the coming of the Holy Spirit, we see, yes, his descent sound the wind. You see the tongues that descend, these uh, cloven tongues of fire. And you see that he has now uh, come upon the church because the church is the one that's now speaking. So you have uh, both of those things uh, manifested, revealed here. Uh, this is vital because it now reveals a couple of important things. Uh, first of all, it demonstrates and it shows to all who are there that the church is now the spirit-empowered, the spirit-enabled entity. The church is not simply a random group of people. Uh, some might have wished to have thought that just a bunch of random Galileans and fishermen who came together and got uh, this uh, great story together. But no, uh, this is a divinely uh, empowered and sanctioned Entity. The Holy Spirit has now testified to the fact that these people are of God. That's what miracles are for, by the way. And whether it's the miracles of Christ or the miracles of Christ's apostles or the speaking in tongues here, they are signs. They are things that men and individuals did that demonstrated and showed to all this isn't just the work of men. This is the work of God. The church is now shown and demonstrated to be the church of God, to be the church of Christ. To be a body sanctioned, authorized, and empowered to go out and to do His work. The church is empowered and it is seen and evidenced to all who are there uh, that it is that. Of course, the other aspect of this, the other thing that it testified to, was the fact that judgment was quickly about to fall upon Jerusalem and upon all of Israel. For as you go back all the way into the uh, to the law that God gave uh, to Israel, uh, that Israel was always told and warned that when nations came and spoke to them in other languages, it was a sign and the pending judgment uh, that was going to fall upon them. You find that in Deuteronomy, you find it in several other places that God warned them that when nations came, Open tongues is a uh, tongue is a sign of impending judgment. Uh, even Isaiah spoke of that, and of how that God uh, spoke in tongues. That's the verses that uh, Paul quoted in First Corinthians fourteen, and trying to explain the purpose uh, of tongues. And so it was this Old Testament sign. So Israel is sitting there, and all, all these Jews heard and listened to these things. They should have went back to the curses described in Deuteronomy. They should have went back to the words of Isaiah and realized that this was a sign. A sign of coming judgment that was upon them. And if the question was asked what judgment they was, could have been, they could have went back to the words of Christ. The Christ told them and warned them that there is coming a day when they, Jerusalem would be destroyed as God judged Israel because they rejected their Messiah. We know he did. Uh, 87, uh, just a few decades after uh, the second chapter here in the book of Acts. God would send a judgment upon Israel and Jerusalem would be burned, ransacked, and destroyed uh, as Rome had its way. And so that is the other side. The tongues were a sign to the unbelievers that judgment was coming upon Israel. It was a sign that these people were truly of God. 
yes, the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit was one to empower the church uh, and to enable them to have the ability to go out and to do the work that God has put before them. And it was evidence, it was a sign of evidence to all around them that, yes, this is God's people and this is God's uh, work that they are doing. Listen to them. Yield to them. And you can rightfully understand that as all men saw this, that they were greatly concerned. Uh, what did they say? What meaneth this? When every man saw this and understood it, they knew that it had to be from God, and they even though they tried to reason it away, well, they're just uh, drunk. Peter just fell down pretty easy because it's only third hour in the morning. Jews morning didn't even eat before noon most of the time by tradition. And so they knew this. So men's ears are now open, men's eyes are open. What does all of this mean? Peter explains a great deal of that as you get into his sermon, which we'll get to the bulk of his sermon uh, next week. Uh, but uh, Peter explains all of these things. He shows to them that this is the sign that God has now come upon uh, the New Testament church. As a matter of fact, Peter would say that this is something like what Joel spoke about. Uh, when he said that God would pour out his spirit upon all people. And all of Joel was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Peter quoted all the old passage, just for context's sake, uh, but it was something very similar to it. Because just as the spirit came upon the church there on the day of Pentecost, there is coming a day, yet future, in the millennial when the Holy Spirit poured upon, out upon all people. And all men will see and they will know. But as you look at the signs of his coming, as you begin to realize the promise has been fulfilled, the church is now empowered. Uh, the final thing I want us to notice this morning, and that stands out, is really the effects of his coming. This is the other thing. As you look here, and uh, really you see this through the signs that are done, but what are men doing here? Uh, as the, they come upon them, they're speaking in tongues, what, what are they actually doing? What are they testifying of verse 11. We're told what they said. Not the detailed version. We don't know all the quarters were said, but we do know what they were talking about. For it says in verse 11 that they heard them speak what? The wondrous works of God. From the very moment that the Spirit came upon the New Testament church, they were obediently testifying and witnessing to the works and the power of God. The Holy Spirit not only empowered them, but it caused them, <coughs> it led them to go out and to begin testifying to the, what God had done. And the great example of that, of course, it has to be Peter as he now stands up and begins to preach. Uh, men are questioning, what, what's going on here? What, what does all of this truly mean? And Peter now stands up and he explains to them and this very detailed sermon about the truth of Christ and what the gospel is and how it was fulfilled, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. You see, the Holy Spirit did not merely come upon them and not merely empowered them, but it also affected them. That is the aspect that I believe that by and large, we ought to emphasize so much today. Perhaps this is what we fall short of so many times. We see the power of God manifested through Scripture. We see the things that He has done, but we don't truly allow them to affect us. You know, when was the last time that we truly looked and we saw all that God did and allowed it to affect us in the sense that it actually made us get up and, and do something? The, the apostles in the church would sit there and say, Hey, Look at here. We've got the power of God. Look at here. We're authorized by God to, to go out and do His work. So we're going to sit here. Hey, it's worked for last week. We'll just keep sitting here. You're not going to do anything. No, they saw, they understood the power, and it affected them. It moved them. It caused them to want to get up and to act. You know, you and I, as God's people, we ought to be affected by the Scripture. We ought to be affected by the power of God. He ought to have an effect in our hearts and in our lives. He ought to make us want to get up and do something. To get up and to do His work. God is high. God is strong. He's here today. We are as New Testament church authorized to go out and present the gospel. God is empowered, giving us the abilities we need to proclaim that word. But do we truly allow 
allow it to affect us to the point that we can actually be good. If we realize it, and if we know it, are we truly allowing that to affect us and make us get up and do things? I pray today that we truly are. You know, and then if you are not truly affected by the greatness of God, by the power that He gives to us, so we need to take the time to look and to examine these things and to realize that God truly is here and He is working among us. And we need to be doing the work that is put before us. God has kept His promise. Christ has kept His promise. He has sent the Holy Spirit to empower us and to enable us to do His work. Uh, we know that to be true because we saw all the signs and evidence of His coming. And they were there uh, from the, the sound of the wind to the fiery tongues that fell. And He's here. The church spoke in tongues. They were empowered there. And that same power abides upon us today. Uh, we don't speak in tongues anymore. It's not necessary. But the power is still here. And we need to realize today that we still have the abiding power of uh, the Holy Spirit with us to the churches. And that means we need to be getting up and doing the work. Uh, we need to still be testifying and witnessing to the wonderful works of God and the magnificent things that He has done through the gospel of Christ. There is much work that we need to do. And we have the power today. We have the ability today to do it. May we as God's children truly uh, be testifying of the wonderful works of God. And hopefully today, if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never truly experienced the wonderful grace of God, uh, then may you today understand that only through Christ can you find the forgiveness of sin. That is the great work that Christ has done. He provides salvation for you and me. All we must do is repent of our sins and believe and trust in Him and receive that salvation. And he would us have a word of prayer. And Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you've allowed us the ability to be here this morning, to look into your word. Father, thank you for the truth that it contains. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit and for his willingness to come and to empower the New Testament churches, to willingness to come and to help us to understand your word, to help us in the work that is before us. Father, help us to ever yield to his leadership, to ever yield to his strength, that we might truly be the witnesses and the workers that you need us to be, Lord, help us to have the wisdom and the knowledge we need to be doing, the grace and strength we need to accomplish it. And Father, we do ask that you would help us to ever be witnessing the gospel of men's need to repent of their sins and believe in and trust in Christ. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you will stand, we'll have just a verse of invitation this morning. If you're here this morning and you have never... Uh, accepted Christ as your Savior, that you've never repented of your sins and believed and trusted in Him today. Uh, God has the power of ability to save. That's what Christ did on the cross. He provided a means of salvation by His shed blood. But if you are here today as a child of God, perhaps you are in a fellowship with Him, perhaps you are uh, working for Him in the way that you need to be. Whatever your needs might be, if you come to sing just a, a verse of invitation this morning. Number 121.